Remember that excitement of turning 16? At 16, when you like couldn't wait to get your license, because that license defined freedom and responsibility. And those were things you wanted more of at 16. Now at 36, I want to trade that in and have less freedom and less responsibility. Because it didn't matter that it was my birthday. I still had all the adult things I had to do that day. I still paid bills on my birthday. That's not, it's not fair, okay? I still had to do the dishes and get my kids ready for school. Uh, the kids still had to be at school on time. I got home, had about 45 minutes of overlap with my wife before she headed off to the youth group on Wednesday night with our um, fifth grader and all of her friends. And it was a pretty busy night. We had cake at about 9 o'clock that night. And then I was in bed Pretty exciting night at 9.30, okay? It's not the same as it used to be. And here's why you and I understand that. Because you and I are responsible for a lot of different things. Because you and I have a lot of different plates that are spinning. Because it doesn't matter if you're a dad or a husband or a mom or a wife or, or if you're still a kid. You've got a lot of stuff that you're responsible for. That you feel like all of it rests on your shoulders. And there isn't a day off from all those things. So in a series like this on Epic Hope... We talk to you a lot about what it means to surrender, what it means to put your faith and trust. We started there with this faith of a mustard seed, and if you would put your faith and trust in Jesus, it would lead to this epic hope, this like satisfaction in your soul that you've been craving, we've been looking for it in all the wrong places, but what is that epic hope we've been looking for? Well, the big picture, the overarching thing that like dangles out there that that is our epic hope is that one day Jesus has made a way to be forgiven and that one day we'll be in the presence of our father in heaven we've got eternity to look for like eternity is is the nugget that we wait for there's no more pain there's streets of gold there's in God's presence everything that we can read about God's presence is that we can't begin to understand how magnificent it is like it's just going to overwhelm our souls. And so that's the epic hope, big picture we hang on to. But there's also this truth that as you walk in faith and in obedience, as you follow closely to Jesus, his way is always better than your way. And that's where we start to get uncomfortable. Because our way is responsible for a whole lot of spinning plates. Our way is responsible for a whole lot of things that if, if we were to stop one of those things, it feels like everything in our life would come crumbling down around us. And so we find ourselves in a position where we love the idea of Jesus as Savior who promises eternity. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But we struggle with the day-to-day trust that his way is a better way than anything we could ever choose for ourselves. And the truth about epic hope is that if you want a a peace that passes understanding, if you want a a satisfaction in your soul, if you want like an eternal thirst to be quenched in you, it comes way more in the day-to-day walk of being faithful and following and trusting who Jesus is and what he said. And that's what epic hope begins to look like. Do you ever feel like sometimes life is happening so fast that even if you wanted things to change, There's too much risk. It would come at too great of a cost. There's a trap here. There is a trap in our mentality that if I give up anything that I'm doing, everything will fall apart. I like the idea of Jesus dying for my sins. But it takes a lot more faith to trust him as the Lord of my life day in and day out. This isn't anything new. This is something that has followed us around throughout the history of of the world. And that's why we can look to God's word and see how Jesus interacted in circumstances like that. And, and so today we're in Mark chapter 10. If you want to get out your Bible or get out your YouVersion Bible app, it also will be on your screen. But I'd challenge you to read along with me on this because I want you to see this in its context. Mark chapter 10, um, Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry. He's right ahead of Palm Sunday. This is the chapter ahead of Mark 11, where Jesus enters Palm Sunday, we'll touch on that today a little bit, but in Mark chapter 10, we see Jesus interact with a kid known as the rich young ruler. Now, what do we know about somebody who's known as the rich young ruler? Well, they're wealthy, so they're well provided for. They're young, so they've been successful, or they've been raised in a family that's provided a lot for them, and we can just assume that they're good looking, because there isn't anybody ugly who's rich and young. And so you can look at this, and you can see that like, This is a person that Jesus interacts with that commands some attention when he walks around. This is somebody that as they enter the picture, people kind of raise an eyebrow because they have it so together in every area of their life and at such 
a young age, that they look for the interaction between a respected figure and this other respected figure on the scene known as Jesus. And that's where we pick up in, in Mark chapter uh, 10 today, in verse 17, when, Jesus, uh, when we see this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees and said, Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now you remember, epic hope, what we've been talking about today, is that promise of eternal life. And so what the young teacher, what this rich young ruler says is, is teacher, I don't have it all figured out. Even though it appears to everyone around me that I do, I'm here asking you, out of respect, what is it that I need to cross the finish line? What is it that I need to have the assurance of eternity with you? In God's presence. And Jesus responds the way that he always does. Okay, he responds with another question. And he exposes a trap in the young man's heart. And Jesus just says this. Why do you call me good? And you need to ask yourself that today. Okay? There's something that needs to hang out here today. And what I want to challenge in you is your measurement for good. Your measurement for good enough. Your measurement for what you see as good and what you see as not good. And, and who Jesus is in that context. And just rhetorically, just be thinking, what is good? Who is good? And what's your role in it, in this measurement system? Because Jesus, back to the text, looks at this young man and he says, why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one's good except for God alone. You know the commandments. You shouldn't murder. You shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't steal. You shall not give a false testimony. You shouldn't defraud. And you should honor your mother and father. Pretty universally acceptable moral attributes. And Jesus just says, why would you approach me and think that I'm good? There's a trap here. There's a how good is good enough trap here that we all find ourselves kind of falling into. There's a place in scripture that says, lean not on your own understanding. Before it says, in all your ways acknowledge him, Jesus, and he'll keep your paths straight. But this default setting in your mentality and mine is that we get wrong how good is good enough. The default setting of how you and I view the world is a checklist of do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, and we mix up who is good enough. And so what Jesus exposes in the young ruler is, who am I? Are you aware of something that people haven't arrived at yet that I am fully God? Or do you have a measurement system in you that sees me as good enough? Because you have to, you have to look at, at, at the economy that we view the world in when it comes to being good enough. And the young man replied to Jesus, Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. So here's where the cups come in. Imagine this is your life. And you approach life as, as, you know, a person who needs something. And you determine what it is that, that you fill your life with and what you find value in. For the rich young ruler, it was a list of morality. It was things that he did really well. He kept whatever commands he had been taught to the best of his ability, and he was quite good at it. He hadn't murdered wasn't big on stealing, honored his mom and dad. Jesus just touches on six of these. There were some like 630 of these. He, he just touches on six of the Ten Commandments that were first introduced. And the guy says, you know, Jesus, I'm actually pretty good at keeping those. I'm already on my way to being enough. But what I'm asking is, is, is how do I get the rest of this satisfied in me? And, and we do this with other things in our life. You know what it is for me? For me, I need the approval of other people. This haunts me. It follows me around. This is something that Jesus is always exercising out of me. This is something that he is always at work at, that I need the approval of other human beings. I, I have scripture written around in my life that reminds me I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to serve the Lord. I'm not trying to serve anyone else but him. But it's something that I, I struggle to define myself with. You ever, you ever get haunted and followed around by your insecurities? And so you act or you project or you try to communicate that you're something that you're not. And when you do it well, nobody sees the truth. And you look a little bit fuller to the people around you. 
There's other things that we do too. We serve in different capacities, and, and these are noble things. These are good things, but you've served in a different capacity before. You ever done something nice for somebody and felt that satisfying, <sighs> look what I did feeling? Now, you didn't say it that way because you know that sounds arrogant, but you know that high that you get after you've served well? It goes in the cup, and it looks pretty impressive because we're over half full. And this is where we start to get to a tipping point, where we start to look at people and go, I wish I was like that guy. He's got a few more things going for him in his cup than I do. You know another place, and that's where our story really gets into today, is is we want to be our own provider too. I can trust Jesus with lots in my life, but when it comes to paying the bills, there's only one person going to work tomorrow morning, and that's me. And sometimes we value people who are good providers, who, who provide for themselves well more than we value others. And so we, we, we fill this cup in this capacity, just like the rich young ruler does, and we present ourselves to Jesus, and we go, Jesus, there's still something missing. And so here it is, what do I need to fill the rest of the space in my life? And we ask Jesus to be a partner. We invite him into a partnership. We even worship him and sing his praises of his partnership. We even try to work and do better at these things, but, but it's right here that we're asking God to satisfy in us. What is left that I need to do to be satisfied? Because what our heart desires is that this cup brim over. What our heart desires is that this be made full and complete, and we want more. And Jesus exposes a trap in the young man. He says, you've got it backwards. You valued A lot of noble things, and it's all the wrong stuff. And our scripture goes on to say this. Jesus looked at him, this is verse 21, and he loved him. Uh, Friends, I want you to remember this, that Jesus loved him. We're going to come back to this at the end. We're going to come back and bring this back in. But Jesus looked at him with compassion, and he loved him. And he said, there's one thing that you lack. And the rich young ruler inched to the edge of his seat. He said, just go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Just go and pour it all out and come back to me empty and we'll start there. And just like you and I, the rich young ruler said, all of it? I've given my life to this. This has defined who I am. I'm a good person. I'm like you. I'm I'm good. And I've I've accumulated all of these years of of self-discipline and all of these years of hard work and all of these years of of, of hiding and and getting rid of all the parts of me I don't like so I could be my best self. I read books about it and, and here I am, Jesus. I only needed an inch. And he said, let's get rid of all of it and just start from square one. And the young man went away sad because he had great wealth. It's a trap. It's a false sense of satisfaction. Timothy Keller talked about this, and, and sometimes we mix up stuff here, and we think that there's this, this call to poverty here, but what Timothy Keller said was this. He said, Jesus didn't mean that it's a sin to be rich. It's not that all individual rich people are bad, nor that all individual poor people are good. Jesus didn't make such blanket assertions, nor on the other hand was he saying, just be careful. Don't fall into greed. Be generous from time to time. No, Jesus was saying that there is something radically wrong all of us, but that money has a particular power to deceive us of our true spiritual state, that we need a gracious, miraculous intervention from God to see it. It's impossible without God, without a miracle, without grace. Friends, we spend our whole lives trying to define what's good enough. We spend our whole lives trying to measure up to the people around us And then we take whatever's left and whatever is remaining and we go, Jesus, I just need you to cap off what's left. I just need you to fill in the gaps. I just need a partnership with you. And what the rich young ruler had was enough money to feel as though he was almost satisfied all the time. But not quite there. The trouble with this is that Jesus doesn't value any of these things on their own. The trouble with with the economy of how good is good enough is that apart from being made good enough in Christ, 
none of this matters. None of this remotely comes close to measuring up to what perfection is in the eyes of God. So here's how the text goes on. In Mark chapter 11, we see Jesus, at the end of Mark 10, Jesus kind of looks at his disciples, and the disciples are amazed, and they look at one another, and they say, who then can be saved? If this guy can't be saved, he'd done all these things, who can be saved? And the rich young ruler's confused, the disciples are confused, and they just feel like, who's the gospel for then if it's, if it's not for this guy? And what they have is a, a false sense of the gospel here. And then Jesus goes on, and we see Mark chapter 10 end. And then we get to Mark chapter 11. You know what Mark 11 is? It's Palm Sunday. That's what today is. Today's Palm Sunday, and it's the day that all of Jerusalem it started the Passover week about 2,000 years ago. The Passover week would have been a week where about a million to a million and a half Jews came and celebrated this Passover meal of God's deliverance out of Egypt. They would come to Jerusalem. They would have a week of of celebration and festivities and dinners planned, and they would celebrate these things. And yet the teaching of Jesus had grown in its esteem, and people were recognizing Jesus as this authority. And so when he entered the city on Mark chapter 11, people cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They laid palm branches down. Jesus rode a donkey into the city, which was significant. It put Rome on notice that this guy was returning like a victorious general. And everyone of Jewish descent looked at the arrival of Jesus and they said to themselves, he's going to be the one that puts us over the top and we'll become the world power. We'll have the authority. We'll have the wealth and the land that was rightfully ours will be restored. And when Jesus wasn't the king that they thought he was going to be, they turned on him and within just a few days had arrested him on Thursday night, had nailed him to a cross on Friday morning, and he was dead by three in the afternoon. And as the sacrificial lamb was sacrificed on Friday afternoon of Passover, so Jesus breathed his last. And your sin and mine, everything that we've ever been made up of, was bought and paid for. Why would people turn so quick? How do you go from from celebrating a man, that this is the promised Messiah, you're you're Hosanna, you're the one we've been waiting for. How do you go in just a week to saying he's not what we thought he was, he doesn't satisfy the last inch of our cup, and so therefore we're turning on him. We can't imagine it when we read it, but we do it every day in our own lives. We try to fill the cup up with our own satisfaction with our own good works. We try to measure up. And he says, it doesn't carry the value it think that you think it carries in the economy of heaven. By Mark chapter 12, Jesus is in the temple courts. He's already made a scene there late in chapter 11 when he went in and he flipped over all the tables of the money changers. And so imagine that day two, Jesus walks back in and people kind of flinch and grip their tables and, and hope that he's not going to make a scene again. And people, in a lot of tension, people who were just welcoming a, a day before start to ask Jesus questions. And they start to ask him, Jesus, what is, is the most important of the commandments? It was a trap question. Looking for Jesus to misstep. They said, good teacher, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus responded with this. He said, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. To this day, Jews will recite the Shema up to three times a day. It is a a cornerstone prayer of the Jewish people. And the Shema begins with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. There is one true God. And then it goes on to say, love the Lord, that one true God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. What Jesus began to quote was something that the man could have jumped into alongside of him in his sentence. What's the greatest command? Jesus. And Jesus says, you, you know, you recite it every day. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind with all your strength. And, and, and then Jesus goes on and he amends it from Leviticus chapter 19 and he says this, the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments greater than these. 
And the, te- the religious expert responded like this. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and that there is no other God but him. And to love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your understanding and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this. He said, these are more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus' ear perks up a little bit. And Jesus responds to him with this. When Jesus saw he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. From then, no one dared to ask Jesus any questions. Why did he say that loving God and loving people are more important to God than all of the sacrifices and all of the practices that the Jewish people had assembled for? Because he was starting to understand something about Jesus. Jesus that it didn't matter what we brought and filled ourselves with, it was never going to satisfy. You know what repentance is? Repentance is turning from an old life. Now, we talk about that. We turn away from sin. We turn away from from addictions. We turn away from, from strongholds. We turn away and we fix our eyes on Jesus. We start to go that direction. I'll tell you something else that we repent from. We repent from the sin of thinking that our good actions could ever satisfy being made good enough in the eyes of a perfect God. And when we repent of that, we turn and we fix our eyes on Jesus. And and what we're promised in a variety of places in Scripture is that Jesus will come in and begin to fill you up as a new creation. He said, this is what you've wanted. Now find it in me. You came to me empty and broken. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I'll give you a new heart. We repent. We turn away. Give me a second. I'm nervous. Oh. Hey, this is what we want to feel like, though. This is what it means to really come to the feet of Jesus. Oh, man, it, it, like, gets to me. Like, If you could just know who defines your worth. If you could just know if that you're not responsible for keeping all the plates spinning. And I know, like, there are some things that we lay down at the feet of Jesus that are painful, that hurt. Like, some of you are in toxic environments. Some of you are rough relationships. Some of you are worried about your your kids and you think, I'm just trying to keep a white knuckle grip on it. You're asking me to leave it all at the feet of Jesus. I am. If anyone wants to be my disciple, they should take up their cross, die to themselves, and follow me. You know what this promise is from Jesus? He says, I'm enough. And then, then get this. In what little bit of decency we have in our heart that wants to do so many of these right things. We want to provide for our families. We want to love our kids. We want to love our neighbor. We want to serve. We want to do all these things. Jesus says, let it come as an outpouring of what I've poured into you. He says, let it just come as like, I'm going to satisfy what your kids need from me. I'm going to satisfy who you are and what your identity is. I'm going to create in you something new. I'm going to do a work that, that makes an impact on the kingdom. He doesn't need us for any of these things, but he invites us into it. But not if we mix up the greatest commandments. Not if we put loving people before loving him. He says, no, no, no. The root of all of it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. I need you to love that God with all your heart. I need you to wake up in the morning and be consumed with how much you love your God. This is the only place it starts. This is the only thing that satisfies. You keep trying it your way. You can keep fighting to get close to it. You can keep succeeding in all the contests that you have in your own brain. I'm telling you, the only one that matters is right here. You know what King David wrote? You remember David? Old Testament David. Uh, We just talked about it briefly in Mark 11, like this this descendant of David, Hosanna, Jesus is coming. This is the man after God's own heart. Psalm 23, some of you have grown up hearing before, but you know what Psalm 23 says? Read it in light of God satisfying us like this. And understand that David's in the presence of his enemies, and he says, uh, when he says these things, he said, the Lord is my shepherd, 
when I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for his namesake. His plan is better than mine. You know why David, who was a a shepherd himself, you know why David, who would one day be a king himself, David, who had the courage to to conquer Goliath, Goliath, do you know why David understood this? David said, I'm nothing but sheep when it comes to the presence of my Lord. I can't even lean on my own understanding. I have to trust that he's my shepherd, that he is my guide, and he'll satisfy me. For his glory, for his namesake, I just camp out in it. Even though I walk through the valley of the, dar- the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil for you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David was surrounded by, by pagan worship where there was human sacrifice happening around him. And in the middle of this valley, he said, even though I walk through this valley in the shadow of death itself, I have no fear. What if you, I mean, what if the satisfying completeness in Christ left you without fear. We didn't make decisions based on fear. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of my Lord forever. That's what epic hope is. That's what epic hope is. It's right there. Now, he bids you come and die. He bids you lay everything down at his feet, empty, and says, let me rebuild you up. I told you we'd come back to Mark chapter 10, 21. Mark chapter 10, 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And that's when he said, there's one thing you lack, go and sell everything and give to the poor. Before he cut the man's heart to its deepest core, before he exposed the most crushing blow in this man's life of what it would cost to surrender and follow Jesus, which should be a a warning to us that there's a cost to following Jesus, to surrender to following Jesus. He looked at him and he loved him. Do you know why Jesus looked with so much compassion and love? Because Jesus is the original rich young ruler. He had all of the splendor of heaven and he left it to be emptied out and made nothing for you. Because when the the greatest need that there's ever been, which was the depravity of my soul, when my sin had left me eternally separated from my Father in heaven, Jesus was bankrupt for your rescue and mine. He's the ultimate rich young ruler. He had everything and he left it all behind and he nailed it to a cross. He took all of your sin and all of your shame and he died for it. This is the greatest news of epic hope that there's ever been. That Jesus, who is the the most high, richest ruler that there has ever been, traded it all for you and traded it all for me. Maybe you should look at your heart and ask, what's competing for the attention of Jesus? What have you assigned too much value? And what do you need to walk away from? What do you need to fast from? What do you need to walk away from and begin trusting Jesus with? And I would encourage you to come back to the words of Psalm 23 and let it fortify your soul as you begin to trust Jesus in this way. For some of you, it's trivial things. It's distractions. It, it, maybe it's your phone. Maybe it's some, some other form of like foolishness that, that we let occupy our attention to detach from reality. But there's other people in here that, that it's a stronghold. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a lifestyle choice. It is an addiction. And you need to surrender it at the feet of Jesus. And trust that when you're made nothing, he'll begin to fill you up. He will begin to satisfy your soul for the first time. And then, out of that response, as we lay it at his feet, as we repent and go, I don't want to be defined by these things anymore, and you find yourself being made into a new creation, I need you to focus first and foremost on loving God and renewing that love every morning, and then out of that capacity, loving people. Come on, you want to be a better friend? You want to be a better husband? You want to love your kids better? You want to love your neighbor? You want to make an impact on the community or on the world? Love God more. Love God more. And out of that capacity, we will love people. 
and we will make an impact that sends a ripple through eternity. Thanks for joining us for that message. If you made a decision to follow Christ or you're just ready to take a next step, we would love to be able to assist you and serve you in that way. You can allow us to do that by simply texting the two words next step to 815-792-9006. We'll make sure to follow up and help you with those decisions and serve you in the very best way possible. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again real soon.